You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 37 of a Life in Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, and I am joined by my co-hosts, David Ian Howe and Connor Johnnan. For this episode, we will be investigating the controversies surrounding the Saruti Mastodon site. Tonight, we have the privilege of having two guests on our show, Dr. Shane Miller, who you will recall from episode 21 of Padawans and Paleo Indians, and debuting on our show for the first time, Dr. Jesse Toon, Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Dr. Toon, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for being on our show tonight. Um, how are the two of you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me on tonight. Dr. Miller, thank you for agreeing to come back on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Semester's over. Woo! Absolutely. And uh, for those that uh, have not listened to episode 21 of Padawans and Paleo Indians with Dr. Shane Miller, Dr. Miller, could you just give a quick reintroduction of yourself and where you're at and what you are studying? I'm an associate professor at Mississippi State University. I do uh, Paleo Indians in the Southeast, kind of how people got into the Americas. And I also have an interest in why that place is one of the few places in the world where people domesticated plants. Excellent. And Dr. Toon, for your debut for this episode, episode 37, could you please give our uh, listeners more of a uh, background about yourself and where what you are studying? Sure thing. So I do a lot of really similar stuff to what Dr. Miller does, um, really kind of ice age hunter-gatherer archaeology, primarily in North America. I've done work in the southeastern U.S. Now, Living out west, I do a lot more kind of Intermountain West research. I've been looking at early hunter-gatherers on the Colorado Plateau. But the thing that really pulls together all of my research and all my interests is really what the relationships are between people and the environments. And so that's led me to recently do some really interesting work actually in Northern Europe. Uh, I was looking at the earliest colonization of Ireland and how that plays into this human environment interaction that I've been looking at previously in the Americas. So yeah, that's kind of what I've been working on these days. Excellent. Well, we're really excited to have you. And so for tonight's episode, we're going to be investigating the Saruti Mastodon site controversy. And I'm going to give a quick introduction to the Saruti Mastodon site for those that don't know. So here we go. <laughs> The Saruti Mastodon Site, SDNHM, locality 3767, is a paleontological and possible archaeological site located in San Diego County, California. A team of researchers from the San Diego Natural History Museum, led by Thomas Demier, excavated the site from 1992 to 1993. The site is named after Richard Saruti, another paleontologist from the museum who is credited with discovering the site during freeway expansion of State Route 54. In 2017, researchers announced that broken mastodon bones at the site had been dated to around 130,700 years ago. This research was published in Nature by Stephen R. Holen and et al. in an article titled A 130,000-Year-Old Archaeological Site in Southern California, USA. The bones were found with cobble stones displaying use wear and impact marks among the otherwise fine-grained sands. Researchers have proposed that these marks were caused by the intentional breakage of the broken bones by hominins using the cobblestones. If so, this suggestion would be older by far than the scientific consensus for habitation of the New World, which generally traces widespread human migration to the Americas to 13,000 to 16,000 years ago. Still kind of questionable. The pones in question are fossil remains of a juvenile male, Mammut Americanum, Mastodon were discovered in stratigraphic layer bed E at the site. The recovered bones include two tusks, three molars, four vertebrae, 16 ribs, two phalanx bones, two sesamoids, and over 300 other bone fragments. The remains of dire wolf, horse, camel, mammoth, and ground sloth were also discovered at the site. Five cobblestones displaying use, swear, and impact marks were also recovered from the site in bed E. The research team found cobbles and broken mastodon bones lying together at the site. Uranium thorium dating of bones from the site estimates a dating of around 130,700 years ago, plus or minus 9,400 years, for the Saruti Mastodon site. 
The research team claims that the cobbles found at the site were used as hammer stones and anvils. The research team also claims that the Mastodon bones show signs of intentional breakage by hominids. If so, this would indicate that some form of homo was present. If so, this would indicate that some form of genus homo was present in the Americas at an extremely early age. However, the dating of the people of the Americas is very contentious subject in archaeology. For most of the 20th century, the Clovis first theory was dominant, dating human habitation of the Americas to no earlier than 13,000 years ago. And we're kind of seeing a push and pull of how far back we can go with those dates with pre-Clovis and Clovis, but we're not going to really get into that. Given the substantial differences between these theories and the Cerruti findings, some researchers have responded with skepticism. Several critics have argued that the evidence from the site did not definitively rule out the possibility that the cobbles may have been altered due to natural causes. Other critics also cite the lack of lithic artifacts and debris. Generally found at sites associated with lithic tool manufacturing at the Cerruti Mastodon site. Archaeologists also cite the lack of taphonomic evidence at the site, evidence that is generally required to support claims of material culture. No human bones were found, and claims of tools and bone processing have been described as not plausible. Michael R. Waters com commented that to demonstrate such early occupation of the Americas requires the presence of unequivocal stone artifacts. There are no unequivocal stone tools associated with the bones. This site is likely just an interesting paleontological locality. Chris Stringer said that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Each aspect requires the strongest scrutiny, adding that high and concentrated forces must have been required to smash the thickest mastodon bones and low energy dep depositional environment seemingly provides no obvious alternative to humans using the heavy cobbles found with the bones. Another 2017 paper by eight anthropologists, including Tom Dillahay, David J. Meltzer, Richard Klein, Vance T. Holliday, and John M. Erlinson pointed out the ample supply of good stone for making tools in the area, saying the absence of clearly modified chipstone tools at the Cerruti Mastodon locality is damning. They argued that nothing has yet been found to prove that there were hominids in the Americas before 50,000 years old. The claim that these stone tools were created by a human was also challenged by a former Caltrans land surveyor who suggested that the site was affected by heavy earth moving construction. That was a slog. And now we're done with that. Connor, take it away. Uh, and that's the end of this podcast. So that's been really fun. Thanks for coming on, Jesse and and Dr. <laughs> Miller. I really uh, appreciate it. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna start off by asking you guys, starting with you, Dr. Toon, just to ask you what your first reaction was to seeing this paper published. What was your kind of gut instinct? Well, honestly, my first instinct about this paper and the site was shock and amazement. I think that there are a lot of larger issues at play related to human evolution, global migration of the genus Homo. And I was really kind of shocked when a paper came out in the journal Nature trying to argue that humans, I should say, that some unknown species of presumably a member of the genus Homo was present in the Americas at 130,000 30, years ago. So this, this paper was just throwing everything away, basically. It's saying, you know, everything we've studied to this point about humans in this kind of time period is, is moot and, and, and things like that. Dr. Miller, do you mind uh, giving us your reaction? So whenever I first, first read this, first off, you know, I'm not allowed to cuss on this podcast anymore. So that I really have to give you the Disney version of my thoughts. And mostly it's just like, this is just such a monster outlier. And that in context like this, we're trained to look for, is it really an artifact or is it really remains uh, that makes it archaeological? Is the dating good? Is the context good? When I first saw this, I'm like, it's so off the wall compared to everything else. My first instinct was, what's wrong with one of those three criteria? Is the date's off? Is it disturbed? Or is it not actually archaeology? So we were in, or at least Carlton and I, I think Connor had moved to Colorado at this point, were in Laramie at the University of Wyoming. And we had all met together at... Or actually, I think first I had Todd in GeoArt class kind of go over it, you know, as a lecture. And he said, you know, like the dates and stuff looks pretty tight in here, but 
it's just still odd, I think was his, I can't remember exactly what it was, but we all met as a group as grad students at my house and I had this like whiteboard wall and Carlton, you can chime in whenever you want, but we like had this whole discussion with uh, Spencer, Eric Robinson, I think Crabe was there, a bunch of other grad students. Yeah, Alex Crabe, Maddie Mackey, Bridget Grun, like Emily Brush. So it was like most of the of the grad students at Wyoming plus, you know, Robro was present because how could he not be? And yeah, we had like this whole discussion about the site and tried to go on, uh, review it as graduate students. And so I think we came to the conclusion that something was like awry with it. And even if it was real and the Mastodon bones were smashed by a human, it would have had to have been a Denisovan like at that point, but like how <laughs> or why? And like the, the no chip stone, cause they were like very good at tool making. It's just weird. And Spencer and Bridget had mentioned like Holland does other papers about elephants trampling bones and like, you know, doing weird stuff with elephant bones and other sites that are also controversially old. So it's weird. But I mean, my initial reaction was like, I got triggered and I don't know if that's a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) And I went on Reddit and was just on a crusade and I was like, you guys don't understand. Like you just don't take this at face value. Like check the other sources and criticisms of it. Like it's don't just read this. It was on ESPN news. I think Eric told me and I was like, is it really? And he was like, yes, dude. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, (laughs) Yeah, uh, Steve Holen has a knack for finding old sites. There's one in Nebraska where he has like a pre-Clovis site, supposedly. So he he's either really good at finding things what other people can't or uh, maybe taking too much time looking at tea leaves. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Toon, because both of you guys are, you know, paleo-Indian archaeologists. Like you, you study some of the oldest contexts of human occupation here in the Americas and, and Dr. Toon, in your case, and beyond. Fundamentally... What is your biggest critique of the Holen et al. 2017 article? Really, for me, the biggest issue is the lack of unequivocal artifacts. I mean, it it's a pretty simple and straightforward problem when it comes down to it, right? We've seen a lot of really clever or really novel approaches for trying to prove and convince people that this is a real site. But at the end of the day, where are the artifacts? All of the pictures that have been published and made available are not anything remotely like what we would expect from a Pleistocene age site. So for me, yeah, it it really is the, the lack of of anything recognizable as an artifact. We're not talking pots, right? You're not talking about pottery or, or, or hose. What kind of artifacts are you talking about, Dr. Toon? Sure. So, you know, if we're talking about Pleistocene age, members of the genus Homo, right? As everyone else in the Americas that we know about, fully modern Homo sapiens, right? Just normal old people, just like all of us, right? During the Pleistocene, everyone is making stone tools, right? At this point in time, ceramic technologies haven't been developed. It's a world of hunter-gatherers primarily, you know, living their their lives based around stone tools, but, but also plant remains and tools, objects made out of uh, animal uh, remains as well. But we don't, typically don't see those plant and animal remains preserving that long because we're talking about geologic time scales here, right? So, you know, really as archaeologists working in the Pleistocene, we're left with stone tools. And what we see at, at Sarudi just looks like a bunch of rocks. They're just a bunch of, of cobbles, right? And so the patterns that we see around the world, right? This isn't even necessarily the Americas, but the patterns that we see around the world with Pleistocene age archaeology doesn't fit with what we're seeing at Sarudi, in my opinion. I think that's an excellent point. Like you put it better than I said it very longly before. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like humans at that time would have had a much more complex tool industry. Uh, and even if they were like walking into the continent or in the sailing at that point, like I don't think they would have had complex boats at that time, but they would have at least known how to procure stone in like a way and like make it more complex, even if they had, you know, a lot more organic, you know, uh, wooden tools or bone tools in, in a way. But like, I guess the tusk that was put upright in the site was what they consider to be a damning artifact, you know? Right. Well, you know, the the tusk is... 
interesting to say the least, right? But nature does interesting things. I've worked on a number of sites where there's no evidence of of human occupation at certain depths, at certain levels of the excavation. But nevertheless, there are really interesting patterns in in how the rocks are aligned and things like that, right? Nature does really weird things. The other thing kind of that you mentioned there and, and led me to thinking about some other issues is that you know, one of the topics that I'm really personally interested in is how do people adapt to new environments and new resources, specifically resources, right? How quickly do people moving into an unknown landscape, how quickly do they learn where resources are, in this case, relevant to, to the site, the, the lithic remains, right? The, or I should say, relevant to the site, the raw material to make these stone artifacts that we would expect to see there, right? For instance, the very first people that moved onto the Colorado Plateau around 13,000 years ago, so a very different time scale here, but the very first people that, that were living on the Colorado Plateau almost immediately were able to learn that landscape, learn the distribution and availability of resources, and started immediately making use out of very fine grain lithic materials for chipstone artifacts for projectile points and, and other types of stone tools. Right. And again, we, we just don't see that at Saruti. Yeah. And I, I'm looking at the notes here. Who, like who said that was Klein holiday and Erlinson and, and Meltzer too. Like, and I, I think Meltzer specifically said like a few nondescript stones or yeah, nondescript stones and bones doesn't change history or doesn't rewrite the textbooks or something like that. I thought that was pretty profound. Yeah. And I think it's interesting, especially, you know, in the context of if this is, if this is either scavenging or processing most sites where we're processing or scavenging occurs, we see lithic material. That's just part of it. It's if it's sharpening a flake, it's if it's sharpening your tool that you're using. Lithic tools are involved in this and and are normally present in pretty much every every site that we see. Dr. Miller, do you have anything to add to this part of it? You know, kind of riffing off that, the thing that I kind of struggle with is okay, let's just let's just humor them and just say, all right, it's an archaeological site. What are they doing there? Are they really mashing up a, a mammoth for marrow? I have a hard time squaring that if you knock something down that big and things that big are running around the landscape and deposits, if you read the original report, which is in that folder that we share with everything, all the PDFs, the report from 1995, there's all kinds of critters in those deposits. So it's not like they're in the middle of a desert or something with a dearth of flora and fauna. What exactly is going on there and that's that's something else that i'm struggling with is kind of not only the absence of stone tool but just trying to connect that to broader behavior that we see going all the way back to africa again it's just it's another instance where it's kind of an outlier excellent and uh with that we'll give you guys something to think about and we'll be back with segment two with jesse toon and shane miller here on our episode 37 Welcome back to episode 37 of a Life in Ruins podcast. We have Shane Miller and Jesse Toon here, and we are talking about the C word, Saruti. <laughs> 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 and, and one of those C words is also um, that is mentioned in the article is um, a cobblestone tool or a hammerstone tool. And Shane, since you're currently unmuted, do you mind explaining what a hammerstone is used for and what kind of marks you get from using it? All right. So whenever you're making a stone tool out of something like a rock that has silica in it that breaks like glass, you need kind of a range of hardness whenever you're hitting your stone that you're going to make a tool out of. So sometimes you don't want something that's harder than that rock. So you'd use something like bone or ivory or wood or some kind of what we'd say is a billet. And then sometimes you want something that's harder to take off larger flakes or flakes of a certain dimension. And so a lot of times what you see in the archaeological record is stones like that are like quartzites, like cobbles, quartzite cobbles that are used as these percussive rocks that you're using to drive flakes off of the material that you want to make your tool out of. And so why that matters is 
there's an article that just came out referring back to the Saruti Macedon where they analyze some of the rocks from Saruti and they find they they argue that they found traces of bone on those rocks and they argue that they're on like the percussive surfaces and that's what they see that's what they argue and that they're using to bust up the bones from Saruti so earlier whenever I was referencing what exactly is a human behavior associated with this this is kind of this is the this is the logic behind why it's an archaeological site to them is you have these rocks that have percussive surfaces that have bone residue on them and you have smashed mastodon bones and people or our ancestors are only the only species that seem to do stuff like that. Well, it is possible that like primates could do it too, but there's no primates that far north in the Americas that large that would use tools like that. Correct. I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, there's like small monkeys in South America that are using stones to like smash seeds and nuts and things like that. But yeah. that's a far cry from using large cobbles to smash mastodon bones. Right. So that's an, and that's again, this is another situation where this is an outlier. So it's just like, okay, well, what is this? So this is like where this this article today there that came out this month in Journal of Archaeological Science reports. Uh, really kind of throws Saruti back in back in the spotlight here because it's part of their battery of evidence that they're arguing that these are actually this is actually archaeological and not paleontological. Kind of building on that, what Shane was just saying. So we have these cobblestones, we have these hammer stones that have micro residues of mastodon bone on them. Okay, so let's assume that everything is correct with that and these bone these stones actually have mastodon remains smudge bits of mastodon bones embedded into the the tiny little crevices of these rocks what does that actually say what is that telling us if we're being honest about it we're saying that rock came into contact with some force with that bone it's not saying that the only way that that happened was humans or some human cousin, some human-related species, picked up the rock and hit the bone. Instead, it's just saying that that rock hit the bone. As Shane already said, the sediments that contain the mastodon remains and purported artifacts are also full of other animals, right? This wasn't the only mastodon on the landscape either. We've seen time and time again with taphonomic studies, especially in Africa, looking at what large animals are doing to the decaying remains of other animals, when they're walking across them, they're, you know, bashing rocks into bones, they're bashing bones against one another, they're even leaving striations on some of the the bones and the rocks as they're walking across them. These striations may resemble, closely resemble use wear patterns on actual artifacts sometimes. My point here is that it's the, the same old story that plagues us archaeologists working in the Pleistocene especially, but but other archaeologists as well, it's the same old story that always plagues us, equifinality, right? Just because that there's bone residue on the rock doesn't mean that humans used the rock to bash up the mastodon remains. So I, I don't know how much I can say about it, but I, I went out to the San Diego Museum of Natural History when filming like a pilot shoot for a, a TV show. They wanted me out there to be like the bone guy, Uh, like, you know, that would say like David Howell, like anthropologist on the bottom and like to show them about that site. Like the point of what I had to do there was do a little experiment with the host of the show and break a cow bone uh, with a rock, put it on the anvil, take a hammer stone and hit it or the, the host did. And then I had to pick it up and, you know, say to the camera, like, well, this is a textbook, you know, green bone break or what did I say? A, uh, Crap, I can't even remember what it was. What's it called? The spiral uh, fracture. Green spiral bone. fracture. There we go. Sorry, too much scotch in me right now. Spiral Are you sure fracture. they brought you on as an expert? Right? This is why the show didn't get <laughs> put on. So anyway, I said textbook spiral fracture. And what the, the doctor on the, it was a, like the a medical doctor who was the host said like, and this was a cool point that 
like when he sees, um, you know, children that come into the hospital that have a spiral fracture in their femurs or their arms, it's often child abuse and they usually have to report it because the only way to make that fracture is that somebody had to do it. And I thought that was interesting, but I remember talking with Larry Todd that he sees, I think it was pronghorn that fall off cliffs that also can get spiral fractures. And there's more to that story that I saw like at the museum, like seeing all the bones and stuff like that. And I, I got to hold them. It was pretty cool, but they're definitely old, but it was interesting. Def- it was spiral fractures. The counterpoint to that, I would add, is that Gary Haynes has made an entire career looking at modern context and showing that I believe that that's not the only way that you can get those bones. He's got like a battery, like a career's worth of looking at context, like, uh, you know, around water holes and things like that, where you get dead elephants and other dead elephants and animals stomping around that you can get stuff like that. So the other thing that just, you know, reading through like all the, the back and forth of the various articles that kind of came after this and all the critiques, there's a couple of things that just really struck me about some of the responses to this and you know, kind of building off Jesse's equifinality comment is one, there is a paper by uh, Met Naren and Michelle Baber who were talking about like how the various critiques played out in press and talked about all the different ways that it's been critiqued and how the scientific process kind of worked in that way. Then there was another, I think it was Magini, how you say his name, that really kind of like pointed out that the way that that article was framed is kind of inductive. And what I mean by that is it's it's like arguing like the original Saruti article is inductive. So it's it's less like a scientist trying to disprove a hypothesis and more like a lawyer trying to build a case. So a scientist is deductive, the lawyer is inductive. And to me, the thing that if this was something that I was working on, one of the things I immediately would be like, I'm going to run every single test I could possibly think of to show that this wasn't banged around by earth moving equipment or it's not stuff that got bashed around in a stream bed. And the thing that always strikes me about even looking at the maps of this site. So if you look at the the maps that Holen et al. publish, if you go and look at it, there's a series of long bones that are kind of oriented from southwest to northeast in their grid. If you look at their refits, they're also oriented southwest to northeast. And if you did dip and strike, so you looked at like the inclination and the direction that the artifacts are pointing, I bet a whole bunch of them are going to point from southwest to northeast. Now, I'd like to see that back plotted against what that area looked like before there's a whole bunch of earth moving. Is that a stream bed or not? How does that actually articulate with all of the earth moving that was done whenever they found this site in the context of working adjacent to an interstate? There was an article that was published that actually framed all that, and they talked about all the earth moving stuff. So to me, I think that's like one of the biggest things I struggle with is like, you know, reorienting it into a deductive scientific approach. That's where I struggle with in, in the way that this is all kind of played out. That makes sense? Or was that long and blah? No, no, that was that was awesome. And I wanted to just kind of mention to our uh, our listeners that, and uh, to, to go extend what Shane said, is that they did an experiment, right, on these bones in the article and then said the marks left by this experiment match what is found here. They didn't do any sort of hypothesis testing or any sort of null hypothesis as part of this, as like this disproving it, like you mentioned. They just said, oh, these things look similar. So this is this is a site. Obviously, this is what happened. But like you like you mentioned that that's that's not how science works. And I know Jesse in the the interim between these, these different segments, you had kind of at least mentioned and talked about the the scientific process and, and how that should work and the burden of proof that is on the people who are publishing these articles. Do you mind expanding upon that? Sure. So, you know, I think really building on, on what you all are saying to me, something that I struggle with, not just with this particular site and this particular research project, but, but a number of of other sites as well that, well, we don't need to go into the details about the other sites necessarily that are complicated and and may not be legitimate, but something that really strikes me is 
is a responsibility, right? Or, you know, burden of proof. Whose responsibility is it to to believe this quote unquote data, right? This isn't a belief system at all, right? This is this is a scientific research project, what we're really talking about here, right? And so the question for me becomes, is it the responsibility of the researchers running the project and publishing the paper to present compelling evidence to show that humans actually were responsible for this? Or is it the responsibility of the rest of the archaeological community, of everyone else reading these papers? Is it our responsibility to just believe and accept what we're being told, right? And when it comes down to it, I don't see that the original authors are meeting kind of that burden of proof, right? They're not presenting enough evidence to really make a compelling argument here. The the whole argument has a number of holes in it in terms of human interaction or human relationships, you know, with this this particular mastodon. So, yeah, it's kind of, you know, my responsibility to accept what someone's telling me versus someone else's responsibility to present a solid case with really good evidence to to support their claims. And I think when I was, you guys might know this a little more than I do from having recently read the articles, but when I was speaking with Demeray at the museum, he had said that you know, they found the site in the 90s, actually, or like or late 90s, I can't remember. But they waited for a long time to publish it because they knew it was going to be controversial. But they sat on it and waited till they had, you know, enough evidence to, to publish it. And I thought it was interesting that, like, you didn't. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. But, like, the evidence that was there was that, the you know, they, they thought the impacts were proven to be there. And, like, the, the bones had the you know, the fractures and, you know, I, I don't know, but like, I, th- I think you're right on the money, like the burden of proof thing, like it. So it's one thing to say humans were in the Americas 130,000 years ago, but then to say a headline that says like archaeologists are flabbergasted, humans were in the Americas 100,000, you know, it, it makes it sensationalized. And then the public in a way doesn't know that it's not, a, not their fault. They, they don't necessarily know that that is a hundred and twenty thousand years more than you know like most people think that people were in the americas or you know give or take but uh it's it's interesting it, it's weird that they it got published i guess is my i don't know I, i'm just rambling but i think one i can't remember if it's this original hole in at all 2017 article like part of their evidence building was that they sent the cobbles out to a lab in australia that didn't know the context. They just said, hey, can you tell us if these marks left on these hammer stones are cultural, as in humans uh, did this, without telling them how old the site was. And it, it kind of came, they came back and said, yeah, that definitely looks culturally modified. So I think part, there's there's that level of how they're trying to justify it. It's like this, we sent this off as a blind test. They, they repeated an experiment to show that these seem to be a correlation between the wear marks. But, you know, I think a silver lining out of this is that this unified both like the Clovis first people and like the pre Clovis people into this discussion to, to really criticize Saruti because it, as, as we've kind of talked about, goes way outside the boundaries of what is by and large archaeologists consider acceptable, but also way outside the boundaries of like archaeologists that are like, maybe people have been here for like 19,000 years, you know, and for 127,000 years, you know, these this article doesn't state like, oh, you know, there must have been a different group of humans here. There could have been a different species of humans. It just says the conclusions of this based on the dates of the mammoth or the mastodon, people did this 120,000, whatever, so much time ago. And we're kind of grappling with the fallout, right? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't do the math that quickly, but I think that was more like it. So I think it's really funny that you started off with like the X-Files theme because I joke around all the time that like if there's like a Molly, a Mulder and Scully relationship, I'm definitely the Scully and Jesse's much more of a Mulder when it comes to the peopling of the Americas. I'm the I'm the doubting Thomas and Jesse. Jesse's more likely to be, want to believe. And I have to say, like going back to that original point about like trying to fit it into the bigger picture, that McNabb article that we shared that 
talked about, all right, well, let's talk about what's going on at, in East Asia at 130,000 years ago. If it's, if it's, if it's really an archaeological site, who made it? And it's just outside of anything. You're, it's not modern humans. It's not Denisovans. It might be Erectus. It's probably not Erectus. It might be. And this article systematically went through and said, look, based off what we know is going on in East Asia, it makes it even more unlikely that this fits into it. So it's just an outlier. I mean, it is just an outlier. And whenever I took stats and back in grad school, our statistics professor told us, like, look, if you have an outlier on your scatter plot, it means one of two things. It's either bad data or it belongs in a different population than what you're studying. And what's more likely that this is some population that we don't know about that doesn't match, you know, over 100 years of archaeology with human origins and colonization of the world or is it bad data and i think it's just more likely that that it's the bad data side of it that there's there that i'm just i, I don't think it's an archaeological site right and and right before you get in dr tune like talking about ath- outliers in, in archaeology you know the viking settlements of north america right are outliers when we talk about European colonization or first attempts of colonization. And I really like that point that you bring up that it's either bad data or it belongs in a different grouping of, of data. So just something for our, our listeners to consider when we talk about, you know, there, outliers are significant for, for a multitude of reasons. And I think we're really in this conversation, as we refer to an outlier, we're talking about bad data. Oh man, Vikings in North America. That's a whole nother awesome bag of, <laughs> Bring that Artifacts. up with Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Please play the X Files theme. Play it. Play it now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. You know the the Viking settlements, Alonso Meadows, is an outlier, but there's incredible evidence to support that. Right. So when we do have these outliers, just like Shane was talking about, right, is it bad data or is it good data, but it's, you know, a different population? Is it is it good data that's telling us something, you know, very different than maybe the initial question that we're, we're asking? So really, I have two comments here, and they're not exactly related. The first is context, right? You were talking about someone... I, I, don't remember exactly who, someone was talking about this blind test where some cobbles, I believe, were sent off for someone to look at and say, you know, are these cultural or not? Are there marks on these rocks that look like humans caused them without any backstory to that? And they came to the conclusion that, yes, it looks like humans are responsible for putting the marks on the rocks. That's great. We have to have blind testing. We have to have control samples. That's part of science, right? But the other thing to really keep in mind here is that archaeology is context, right? We have to have the context to actually be able to understand what it is we're looking at and make valid interpretations of the data, right? Because let's be honest, what it comes down to is, as archaeologists, we're looking at, at data and we're interpreting that data to try to understand what it means about people. This is not a story about rocks. It's not a story about busted up Mastodon remains. It's a story about humans. And in this case, human evolution, human migration, right? Human adaptations to new landscapes. So we have to keep all of this in mind, right? It, the context here is so critical. And the second point that I want to make, someone referenced the site being first discovered in the 90s as part of a, a mitigation project related to the construction and expansion of an interstate, right? It was initially done as a mitigation project, a paleontological mitigation project. And in that final report of the actual paleontological mitigation report, they refer to these sediments as a Pleistocene stream deposit. Now, more recently, the, there's been a much more in-depth analysis of the sediments. But to me, that, that's really interesting that 
their the researcher's initial interpretation of the context of this site was that it was from a stream deposit. That tells us something about what the environment looked like, what the sediments looked like that these bones and cobbles were in, right? If we're talking about an actual stream deposit, we're talking about a relatively high energy setting where these rocks and bones are smashing together, right? Now, I know that's somewhat of a different geomorphic context than what was published in 2017. But nevertheless, that, that very first report from the 90s does refer to it as a stream deposit. Absolutely. And I think I'm being abducted. Oh, as soon as we'll be back. Connor, what what is so misty out? Yeah, what what's 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 going on here? Do I hear drums? The Vikings below, they're, they're covered with their ships and they're covered with their pillage. I, I can't pay me my taxes below, they raided my fields, they took my horses. I can't pay below. Why was I talking about Vikings again? Oh yeah, Shane, take it away. I don't, wow. Uh, See, so you guys do this every once in a while, like you, you, you come at come at us from like an, an angle that I really I wasn't prepared for. You were like, okay, cool. Let's talk about Vikings. But the skit, I, I really... Here, that's I got something, you. man. That's something. It was a callback to a few episodes ago. I was playing uh, Katam with my friends and we... Yeah, anyway. <laughs> okay, I got this. I got this. Uh, so, welcome back to episode 37. I'm um, also known as the Settlers of Katan, also known as... Settlers of Saruti? Yeah, also known as the D&D. Um, we were we we talked in the last segment about Vikings, and my co-host can't stop giggling like little children here. <laughs> and Shane, uh, we talked in the interim, and you wanted to make a, a a point about Vikings. So, is that a better segue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. So the point that I wanted to make though is, so is the Viking settlement in eastern north america is it really an outlier if you really want to look at it from a con like an archaeological context and i would say that it's it's not so if you just randomly bumped into that site and you're like what the hell is it doing here this can't be right this has to be this can't be a viking site even though everything looks kind of viking if you look at the broader archaeological record of the north atlantic you can follow the breadcrumbs back from Scandinavia to settlements in northern France and England and then Iceland and then Greenland and then follow oral histories of the Norse to to kind of connect the dots that this is part of that larger expansion of people across the North Atlantic about a thousand years ago, give or take a few Thursdays. So it's not really that much of an outlier. It's part of a broader pattern. And it's just a different population than the Native American story up to that point. So you could see that site and be like, all right, it's an outlier as far as Native American sites and what we'd expect. But it's not an outlier in terms of the colonization of people across the North Atlantic during Viking times. So that's what you don't see 100,000 years ago in Northeastern Asia that makes Saruti such an outlier. You don't have that like Hansel and Gretel archaeological set of breadcrumbs that you can follow back and be like, okay, this makes sense because these people were here, they were here before that, and they were here before that, and so this is a starting point, and so it fits into that whole entire trajectory, and just Saruti just straight up does not do that. Whereas the Viking thing in Eastern North America does. Did they bring the horses, Carlton? <laughs> oh, boy. Is this an illusion, though? No, I think all all evidence that we have in terms of North American horse genetics after sixteen something, they're all they're all Spanish. So no no Norse horses ended up here. Is that a thing? Do people think that? No, it's just something like a passing thought I had. I was like, I bet people do think that, but I don't think they brought horses because they how they fit them on there. Well, according to the uh, you know hyper accurate documentary pathfinder they definitely bring <laughs> horses, horses with them but they had those um, little yeah, icelandic but... ponies <laughs> yeah. giant man on an icelandic pony <laughs> they just rode them in the water <laughs> oh boy and then you uh, had a, a second point about the um the geology or when you're talking to non-archaeologists uh, how do we find evidence and you want to relate that back to the um, 
Creek Bank. I think Jesse's point in that last segment about it being a Pleistocene stream. So why does it matter if it's an Ice Age stream or not? And the point that I that I just made was it that we really have two when it comes to stone tools and have sites like Saruti, we really have two lines of evidence that we really have to lean on on whether whether or not something's an artifact. And that is does it have pattern breakage that seems to imply that somebody has some kind of design on it? And sometimes that's that's a hard argument to make to basically just say that this is a pattern that you don't get in nature. The other thing, the other way that you do it is you make an argument that this particular artifact does not belong where you find it geologically. It's like a big rock on top of a sand dune. Wind is not going to blow a giant rock on top of a sand dune. It's more likely that somebody would have left that rock on top of a sand dune. So that's, and so this is why that whole debate about whether or whether or not the artifacts in Saruti are in a Pleistocene stream stream or not. And part of the debate about this site is, how much activity is going on in that stream really bears to this. It's like, is this a natural assemblage of things that got busted up and knocked around or were some mysterious population of people or proto people busting it up and knocking it around? So is it nature or people as an archeological site or not? So that's where that kind of falls in. So let's not forget that Southern California has made the news with these types of sites before, right? It was Southern California, San Bernardino County, basically just down the road from Cerruti, where the whole idea of geofacts really emerged for the first time, right? With Vance Haynes's critique of the Calico site, uh, where Haynes is basically saying that these rocks that some people think look like they might be human-made artifacts or actually just rocks that have been fortuitously jumbled around and smacked together by natural forces enough times throughout the history of Southern California, basically, as a geologic you know, time period, that over a long enough period of time, these rocks will flake in a way some rocks, I should say, will flake in a way that vaguely resembles what people might do, right? And so, to me, it, it's really kind of just a an odd coincidence here that we're back in Southern California talking about the same thing again, right? Time is a flat circle, to quote Rust and Cole. I don't know if there's like any sort of like geologic stuff going on in california there's like this is there like subduction or something was it known for earthquakes i can't quite remember i'm thinking that you should have matthew mcconaughey on your soundboard for times like this that that needs to be definitely <laughs> like i feel like time is a flat circle all right all right all right that right. 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 circle is is a good one yeah absolutely as an extension of this entire conversation is about Saruti. And, we, and this last last segment, we kind of touched upon uh, an article by, I just had it up, was it the uh, Magnani et al. 2019, evaluating claims for an early peopling of the Americas in which they go through different hominins, right? In which, and that I, that's not even the right article. Which one, Dr. Toon, had all the... They so kind of did. Magnani did. But I think you're talking about. Is it Sutton? Sutton. Sutton. He, that was the guy who they were like, we tried to analyze it, but we couldn't get access. McNabb. McNabb. Oh, yeah. McNabb. Evaluating claims from early people in the Americas, the broader context. Yes. Yeah. This is the one where they go in through all the different hominins and basically saying, like, you know, if, if you if we're claiming that there are people this this old let's let's look at what's going on in the broader context of the world and you know we need to look at eastern asia and basically saying hey there's there's no one really here right that could have possibly migrated into the americas so the the fallout of the holland at all article from an indigenous standpoint right 
there, there's been a, a scholar in particular that has really grasped onto the Holland at all, at all article, and that's Dr. Paulette Steves. And um, she's been on the uh, Archaeology Podcast Network before on the Heritage Voices podcast. I believe that's episode 31, Reclaiming Indigenous Histories in the Indigenous Paleolithic. And, you know, we do have a group of Indigenous archaeologists in this country that are doing Indigenous archaeology within a collaborative context and welcoming context with that integrates Western science with indigenous ontologies and to make greater oftentimes, you know, in, in, in the mission of making greater interpretations, right? And then we have Dr. Paulette Steves who comes along and says, this site, the Saruti Mastodon site, shows that indigenous peoples in this country have been here longer than Clovis, which is bogus. She, and she wrote articles about Cl Clovis is bogus. And that the critiques of Holin and his colleagues in that paper justify the racist nature of archaeology and show how archaeologists are actively dismissing and trying to dismiss indigenous oral histories. And so from a perspective of, of Dr. Toon and, and Dr. Miller, like when when someone from an indigenous community says like this is this is legit and this this verifies indigenous oral traditions. And as a citizen of the Pawnee Nation, I can who studies my oral traditions, I can say that my oral traditions in the Pawnee Nation clearly talk about a, a Beringian migration. I don't believe that Paulette Steve speaks for all the 560 something indigenous nations in this country recognized by the federal government. But like, what is what when you hear something like that, because this has been in popular media as well, I don't know if we're following the same news cycles. But when someone like Paulette Steve's makes these claims, like how how do you respond or what what is your first reaction? This is a tough one, guys. This is a tough one because I like to keep things like in bounds, right? Like for Saruti, it's part of an academic debate. It's a series of articles that go back and forth. And me as a person who is writing about early people in the Americas and the American Southeast, I have to be well versed in that debate. And so whenever I'm writing my own stuff, I have to be up on the literature, evaluating arguments, incorporating that in. And at the same time, it's not in a bubble. It's not, it's not like isolated and, and cauterized from the rest of the world. It has real sincere consequences for a lot of people and how they view their place in the world that comes down to things like claims of tribal sovereignty, you know, like how long that they've been there, like how that is worked into their claims and particularly in places where, you have like our federal government who's doing what they can in some instances to try to like snatch tribal claims out from under certain groups. It's something that's not taken as a given that these tribes will always have those claims. It's something that if you follow any handful of natal, native scholars on Twitter, it's, it's always like this situation where for good reason, they always feel like they're in the fight. And this is all part of that fight is trying to figure out the archaeological record, how long they've been there, and these claims matter. And so the other side of it is, you know, somebody who's a colleague like Paulette, who's a professor, you want to root for your colleagues because academia is hard. You want to be supportive. You want to be fair. And so sometimes when you disagree with people that you really like or that you think you might like, and sometimes liking has nothing to do with it, you want to be fair. And in some instances, in some sites, you know, I can find some common ground and I can think, OK, well, maybe like a good example would be like Paige Latson in Florida. It's a pre Clovis site. I think the world of Jesse Halligan, I think she's a really, really good archaeologist. Still trying to figure out if that site is legit or not is something that is worth the debate. But whenever you start getting into things that are less about the academic uh, debate and evaluating the claims on merit and instead worked into things that are a little harder to quantify, a little more political, a little more I'm trying to grasp for a word and I'm struggling to find it. It becomes more difficult because in this case, it feels that some of the claims being made are not unlike what you might get from creationist. Like whenever I'm back home in East Tennessee and talk to somebody who thinks the world's only 6,000 years old. It's like the inverse of that kind of debate. And it makes it hard. And I don't have an easy answer. 
I, I just think from my perspective, the best that I could hope to do is just be fair to my colleagues and evaluate claims for what they are. You see what we did there? We coaxed you guys in with a Viking skit, and then I'm like, well, bam, well, bam. And yeah. Doing archaeology and colonism. Yeah, we just, that was, you see what I did there? All right. What about you, Dr. Toon? So these types of, of questions, right, these types of discussions are, are really important. They always have been, and, and especially today, they're increasingly important. As, as Shane was talking about, right, these types of repercussions and, and levels of significance that we as archaeologists are, are working with, right, they, they have real meaning to issues related to culture history, oral traditions, origin stories and and land rights, land sovereignty, right? Yeah, it's one of the things that I'm really personally proud of my work in the Colorado Plateau, because the history there, the archaeological history and the kind of common knowledge that most people have about the Four Corners area and, and the central Colorado Plateau, in terms of human history, it starts there about 3,000 years ago with agriculture. If you go to an archaeological site, if you visit a place like Mesa Verde, for instance, most of the information starts around about 3,000 years ago. The work that I and other people as well, but, but the work that I've really been doing in that area the last few years has been focused on pushing that story of human history of indigenous occupation of that landscape back much earlier, right? And I think that plays heavily into the significance of national monuments and parks and public lands like Bears Ears National Monument, right? That's one of the small parts of why that is so important uh, and is being fought today in the legal system to restore the boundaries of that national monument because it was created in the first place, partly because of the density of archaeological sites, but also in consultation with indigenous communities in the region that call that area home and always have called that area their ancestral homelands. So if we as archaeologists can work to show that indigenous peoples were on this land much earlier than 3,000 years ago when people started farming, for instance, just in the Colorado Plateau, right? Then I feel really good about what I'm doing, right? It, It shows that there's real significance and merit to archaeological research. The other thing that comes to mind here is that I'm really proud about where I work. I'm an assistant professor at Fort Lewis College. This is the largest public college or university in the country that is a native serving institution. We graduate more indigenous students with bachelor's degrees than any other public institution in the country. And so these are conversations. These are topics that I and my colleagues at Fort Lewis College personally deal with on a daily basis, right? These are conversations that we have with our students every day, right? How do we square archaeological science with indigenous knowledge, indigenous, you know, traditional knowledge? How do these things work together? And it's not for me as a white Irish guy to to step in and talk about someone else's ancestry and cultural history, right? As far as Pleistocene colonizations go, Pleistocene human colonizations of the world, and and I think it's important to make the distinction colonization here when, when we as archaeologists are talking about colonization, we're talking about an organism, humans in this case, moving into a new landscape, not colonization 
in terms of European colonization of the world and genocide of indigenous populations around the world. I'm glad you brought up Fort Lewis College statistics, like 41% of Fort Lewis College students are Native American. And um, there's a tuition waiver for Native American students to attend that college. Like it's actually, it can be tuition free for Native Americans uh, that listen and highly, highly recommend it. My niece goes there. We're really at the butt, the butt end of this segment. I, I wanted to end this like a court case. I wanted to give you guys your last, um, your, your final argument argument about Saruti and kind of the bigger context of it and how to interpret information like this. So Dr. Miller, if you don't mind starting off by giving us your closing argument. All right. My closing argument. If, if this is a course <laughs> case, I'd, I'd definitely be prepared and have notes and be wearing a tie. <laughs> but, you know, I think I'd start with this from maybe a different angle than maybe what Carlton was expecting with the or like trying to get at with Paulette Steves and I think I would say like look I I don't necessarily think that Paulette and I have contrasting worldviews in a lot of ways what we want to do ultimately is understand how the how the Americas were colonized and we both understand where that has some real sincere political ramifications for a lot of people I think maybe where Paulette and I would differ is she takes the position that pushing that story as far back as you can is the way to kind of give that political oomph or political power in a court of law. If you are arguing like in front of the Supreme court or something like that. And where I would argue is I'm not sure necessarily pushing it as far as back as it can go for argument's sake is the way to go. I think like finding the tightest story with the most overlapping sets of data that fits into a larger archaeological story packs the most punch. And I think that overlapping most data rich, data supported narrative is a post last glacial maximum story that lines up with the archaeological record of East Asia, Beringia, the Americas, lines up with DNA. We know what the sites look like. We know how to analyze them. There's a broader pattern it fits into. And to me, that's how I'd make my argument and that necessarily pushing it back to 100,000 years and having it be such an outlier, I'm not sure that that's necessarily the way we need to be making arguments in archaeology. And I'm not necessarily sure that that's how we should be doing this for trying to make cases for native sovereignty and stuff like that. I think the most data supported story is the best story. The jury is swayed. So <laughs> the jury is swayed in, in rules in favor of uh, Dr. Shane Miller. Dr. Jesse Tune, do you mind giving us your final argument? Sure. You know, I agree a lot with what Shane was just saying, right? I think the bigger picture here is about context and context in a number of different ways. We can look at, as, as Shane laid out, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but as Shane laid out, there's a, a clear continuity in archaeological sites and the history of human migration around the world. We can track ourselves at we can track humans around the world, archaeologically, genetically, linguistically, looking at oral traditions as well, right? And when we see a proposed site like Sarudi, it, it doesn't fit to that context, and it doesn't follow in line with that continuity that we see connecting everything else. I also think that we have to be really careful with the types of sites that we just outright agree with and, and support, especially those sites in the Americas where there are claims made that they're so old, modern homo sapiens were not responsible for them. Getting back to what we've been talking about in the last few minutes in terms of indigeneity, and how long people have been on this continent. If we're saying that some of these sites, 
Saruti or or others that are really old were created by non homo sapiens members maybe of the genus homo but but just not modern humans how does that square with indigenous peoples because if you follow that line of reasoning to the end what you're saying is that indigenous peoples are not humans like everyone else in the world and i say this as clearly not an indigenous person but to me that that is cause for alarm and and, and and causes me to pause, I think, when we really think about the context and the, the implications for what some of these early purported sites may mean. Now, with all of that being said, um, I would also like to see, you know, more clear evidence about artifacts present at Saruti and some of these other last glacial maximum or pre-last glacial maximum sites in the Americas. Um, I, I don't think there's good archaeological evidence of artifacts at those sites necessarily. But, you know, we, we just got to get out there and, and keep hammering away at it, keep looking for sites and keep excavating sites and, and keep doing research. Excellent. That was, you know, both well put by both of you. This has been a, a fantastic conversation, I think, for a first in where we bring on two distinguished professionals to talk about a site we haven't done this before i think this went great and we'll we'll explore this in the future um thank you both so much for coming on especially with how how last minute this has been in terms of, of getting this together I so like with I that, grad school again that's cool yeah, yeah. this is yeah, this like was, the opposite was, of you guys is like usual mo where i was like shocked at how professional you were and like how far out in advance you guys prepared stuff and like I had like gotten like fancy emails and all this other stuff. But I'm like, geez, these guys, they have their act together. This is the opposite of that. This was literally like back of the envelope text messaging. Like, hey, you want, you want to do this? You want to talk <laughs> Mastodons today at seven? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this, all, this all started. We were, like I said, we were originally just going to do an episode with the three of us. And then you sent us that article last night. And so we were talking this morning, like, well, look, let's just have Shane on. Let's just have a talk, talk about Saruti. We haven't done that. And then just kind of progressed from that. And when we texted Jesse, I was like, Dr. Toon, we're usually far more formal and bureaucratic, like do this months in advance. There's outlines, there's paperwork, and you're getting a text message. So yeah, this is this is this has been an anomaly all around. So this has been episode 37 of a Life Ruins <laughs> podcast, where we investigate the cruise of those living life ruins. We have been here talking about the Saruti Mastodon site with uh, Jesse Toon and Dr. Jesse Toon and Dr. Shane Miller. And uh, join us next week for episode 38 with uh, Kevin Gover. He runs the American Indian Museum in DC and he's also the subsecretary. He'll be here next week. We're now doing an episode each week, four episodes a month. Whether you like it or not, we're coming to your ears. So uh, with that, we're out. Thanks for listening to a Life in Ruins podcast. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at a Life in Ruins podcast. And you can also email us at a Life in Ruins podcast at gmail.com. And remember, make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer. So traditionally, this is a section which we've been I've been using dad jokes from my own father, but this is my own dad joke and it is terrible. Are you coming out that your, your wife is expecting? <laughs> I am not a father, but I think like a dad. Hey, congrats on getting married, by the way. I think since I was on last, you got married. So some sometime in between whenever I was on and now you got married, right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> no, thanks, Shane. I, I super appreciate it. And yeah. I wanted to. I, I snuck in it. It sucks while you were talking, Shane. So. <laughs> That's why me and David are laughing. <laughs> she doesn't listen to this podcast, so we're good. Thank goodness. Yeah, so uh, I wanted to ask uh, what was the critical error? With, with Saruti. We talked about a bunch of different things, but I'm making a joke out of it. What was the critical error with Saruti? What was Saruti? the critical error? I don't know, man. They made a mastodon out of a molehill. Oh.
Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Jesse appreciated that one. My students would boo me out of the lecture hall for that. Oh my god. <laughs> Boo this man! <laughs> I'll beat myself out. <laughs> oh. Just one. Guys, right, we're oh. out. Bye. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.